Hey yo, what's up Mavuno Church? Welcome to the third Sunday of August. For those who don't know me, my name is Kevin Kilonzi and I'm one of the pastors at Mavuno Church. My wife, Pastor Faith, and I have the awesome privilege of overseeing the downtown network in the Mavuno Church and we are loving it. I truly want to appreciate you, our senior pastors, Pastor M and Pastor Carol. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share this message through this month. You guys are amazing. You guys will love you. And we just want to pray that God will continue just taking you to the next level uh, because we are right uh, behind you. If you are new here or you just bumped uh, into this channel, welcome to church. Now, earlier this month, we began a brand new sermon series that you're calling New Yes, you. And in it, we are looking at how we can influence the change that we want to see, how we can bring lasting change to our nation. On the first week, we asked the question, you, yes, you, will you say yes to the call? And then last week, we looked at the conversation on surrender and we said, you, yes, you, will you say yes to surrender? Now today we continue diving deeper into this topic as we focus on Moses uh, uh, from the book of Exodus. Now, at the end of all the arguments, at the end of all the affirmations and signs that God gave Moses, Moses still needed to get to work. And the Bible tells us that he hooks up with his brother Aaron and together they, they go uh, to uh, Egypt and they connect to the people who are in the oppressive system. The Bible tells us that Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of Israelites and, all, uh, uh, and, and Aaron told them, everything that the Lord had said to Moses. He performed the signs before the people and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. That's Exodus chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. Moses shares with the people that uh, uh, what was in God's heart concerning them. You see, most influence work falls apart because the people who bring you know, the solutions don't know the specific pain or questions that the recipients of the solutions are asking. But Moses starts by developing a concern for the people he was, uh, he was being called to redeem. Let me say this, it's a dangerous thing to bring solutions to a people who don't even know that they have a problem. And so in whichever field that God is calling you to influence, you need to connect to the people being affected. You need to connect to the people in the issue so that you can get to know the questions that they are asking. Then after that, the Bible tells us that Moses and Aaron went ahead to confront and to face Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 tells us this. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. What a shocking shock. Moses does what God asked him to do, but just because God had sent him, it doesn't mean that the powers that be were willing nor ready to, you know, to surrender and to let the people go. And I think that's a realization that many of us don't always make uh, when, when, you know, when God calls us. You know, sometimes you respond to God's call. You, you develop a concern for the people. You, but, to, but when you go to the field, you get shocked when you face opposition. You must realize that even though you're fighting a defeated enemy, he's not willing to surrender or even to give ground. That, but that, that doesn't mean that you back down. That means that you keep going forward because opposition is a confirmation of your strong position on the matter. Come on, somebody. Obedience to God's direction doesn't always mean that you get results instantly. But it does mean that you still do what God wanted you to do, even at the risk of failure. Obedience is doing what God has asked you to do in the power of the Holy Spirit and then leaving the results to God. Now, Moses and Aaron go and they confront Pharaoh and, rest, and, and then Pharaoh responds by setting a series of straps in the, uh, that, was, that was supposed to derail them from pursuing the thing that God had told them to do. And I believe that these same traps will be set up for anyone who is serious about influencing any form of change in our society. The devil has traps for you that will keep you, uh, you, you know, feeling like you're making traction, but that will keep you and derail you from pursuing your God-given purpose. And the first trap 
that the enemy set up was, is called the trap of discouragement. Somebody say the trap of discouragement. Exodus chapter 5 verse 6 to 9 says this. That same day, Pharaoh gave orders to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so they, can, so they, they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Wow. You know, sometimes God tells you to do something, but then the enemy responds by laying the trap of discouragement. Discouragement for the Israelites came in the form of worse work condition. Pharaoh removes some work input, but then still requires them to deliver the same outputs. And this move was meant to discourage the people. And that could be you here today. Maybe you stepped out and did what God asked you to do. You quit the workplace. You started a business. You confronted a colleague. You stayed in the marriage. You gave your first fruits. You remained faithful with the tithe. You went to church with your offering. You did the thing that you were supposed to do. But then instead of things getting better, they only got worse. The cost of business went up. The deal fell through. The promotion was given to another person. The contract was not renewed. The bureaucracy of the, of the project discouraged you. Licenses were denied. The marriage got even worse. This kind of discouragement that the children went through, and this is the kind of discouragement that many of us go through, and you start mistrusting God and his word towards you. You start thinking, man, God is not to be trusted. Or you start thinking that, man, God is not holding out on, on his end of the deal. You start doubting whether you are called. You start, you start feeling worn out and you start feeling tired. You start feeling uh, burnt out because of discouragement. Some of us even start wondering whether you are the right person for the job. And I want to let you know that, 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 that discouragement is there to drive out spiritual disciplines that you started with, to drive out prayer, to drive out fasting, to drive out reading of God's word because you just feel tired. You feel tired with the fellowship. You feel tired to testify because of discouragement. And this is what happened to the children of Israel in the Bible. The Bible tells us that when the conditions got worse, that Moses went out to God and cried and said, God, why have you done this? I did the thing that you asked me to do. And at that point, God talks to Moses and he tells him, Moses, I'm still on track on delivering my promise to the children of Israel. And in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 8, the Bible says this, Say to the Israelites, listen to this, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will flee, free you from, the slaves, uh, fr from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will uh, uh, be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I saw you with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Man, can you imagine? God is talking to these guys in such a prophetic voice, and he's, he's actually talking in past tense. I have delivered you. I have, like, he, in God's mind, He's already done the thing that he said he'll do for the people. And he said, I'm going to do this thing, man. I'll do what I said. I'll make good the promise. I'll deliver you. In fact, God is not even saying, if you do this, then I'll do it. He's just saying, yo, I, I am doing it. The, the part of the equation that you are in in this relationship is a recipient. Because God is going to do it. But then do you know what happens to the children of Israel because of discouragement? Exodus chapter 6 verse 9, the next verse, the Bible says this, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Discouragement makes you unable to hear God's voice on a matter. And maybe you're here today and you're going through some level of discouragement. Maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's at work. I want to let you know this. Guys, go back to hearing God's voice. Go back 
because God is still working in the background. In fact, I want to invite you to prepare mentally because as we get into the next season, uh, we, we're going to take some time for prayer and fasting. And we're going to be praying and fasting from August 26th all the way to September 1st. And I want to invite you to pray and fast together with us. Go back. That discouraging voice, go back to hearing God's voice on the matter. Because even for you today, he's saying, I will deliver you. And so you, yes, you, don't give in to discouragement. Now, when the guys managed to go through that season of discouragement, the enemy laid another trap called the trap of doubt. The trap of doubt. Exodus chapter 7, verse 10 to 12 says this. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret acts. Each one of them drew, his, uh, drew down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. So, here Moses performs the first miracle uh, before Pharaoh by repeating, you know, the first sign that God had done through him. But somehow the magicians also repeat the same miracle by some magic acts. And so you can imagine what could have happened if you and I were there in the place of Moses and you do the thing that only, like, only God could have done this. And then the magicians come and they do the same. You're like, what? You mean not only God can turn a staff into a snake? You mean that, you know, uh, other people can do that as well? You, know, you mean people who don't know God can do that as well? So what's the difference between I who's doing everything to follow God and other people who are not? And the magicians replicated not just this, uh, uh, you know, turning their staffs into snakes, but they did the second, you know, uh, plague of turning water into blood and, and you know, uh, uh, they called fro for frogs as well. I believe that this introduced doubt concerning the power and sovereignty of God. You see, the presence of competing alternatives can cause us to have doubt. The similarity of results from two opposing sides can introduce doubt. And this trap of doubt affects many believers today. We doubt whether uh, uh, there, there, there is only one true God. We doubt whether there is only one way to God. We doubt whether, you know, uh, 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 God's ways are, you know, the only ways that we should do something. We doubt whether God is able to make good his promise to us. And all these ha problems happen. All this doubt comes in when alternatives uh, show up. The world has alternatives that seem to work. And those things are there to create doubt in you. But I want to share with you something. Are you ready for me to share with you something? Wherever you see alternatives in the world, please notice this, that a couple of things I want you to notice about alternatives, uh, whether it's other spiritualities, whether it's other methods, I want you to notice this about alternatives. Number one, they are always inferior solutions. As it was in the case of snakes, uh, the Bible tells us that Moses' uh, staff, the snake, ate up the magician's snakes. And so the devil doesn't have originals. The devil creates counterfeits that are no match for the original. Now, the, 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 the fake can look very much like the original, but it's inferior. It's inferior. Number two, the, any other alternative solution makes a bad situation worse. It makes the situation worse. You know, in the alternative, for example, in the magicians, they... <laughs> They, 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 Moses creates a snake and the, the magicians now create a snake as well. And, now, and then the, the, their, snakes, the, the, their staffs are eaten. So they, they came into the equation with staff, but then they had no staff. <laughs> and, then, and then the other part is, you know, Moses turns the water of the Nile into blood and the magicians take the only remaining water in Egypt and they turn it into blood. You're like, we wanted more blood, we wanted water. <laughs> They should instead have turned blood into water. But they make a bad situation worse. Later on, Moses, you know, they create frogs. And guess what the magicians do? They also create more frogs. You're like, great! What we wanted was frogs in Egypt, right? <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know uh, uh, but what does, you know, instead they should have made the frogs disappear. But alternative powers that juju man, that, you know, whatever, they will make a bad situation worse. A, a, a alternative powers create a, a, a worse situation. Number three, and I believe this is the worst of them all, alternative as, as solutions 
uh, they hardened their heart. Ultimately, the magicians, when they provide an, alter- an alternative, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh hardened his heart. The more you search out alternatives, the harder it gets for you to turn towards God. Even, even currently, you know, maybe you are going through an issue, maybe you are going through a financial issue, maybe you are going through an issue at work. The, the, the more you turn to alternatives, the harder it gets for you to actually hear God's voice until it's like, you know, like everything has happened. And so uh, turn, you know, don't let doubt harden your heart because you turned to alternatives. And so you, yes, you, what alternatives have you turned to because of doubt? Now, when they were able to go through that trap of doubt, the enemy set yet at that trap. And this was a trap of deception. Pharaoh was a conniving, deceiving fellow. And in a number of times, Pharaoh tells Moses, you know, uh, 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 he actually, you know, Moses, they create a, a, a plague and, and Pharaoh comes to Moses and says, you know, make the plague disappear and let the Israelites go. And he did that during the plague of frogs. Uh, and the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 8, verse 8 and 15, I'm going to jump a couple of verses there. It tells us that Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then we jump to verse 15 and it says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was no relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses as Aaron, and Aaron rather, just as the Lord had said. Can you imagine? Please do this thing, I'll let you go. And then Moses does that and then he hardened his heart. He doesn't let the people go. In fact, at some point Moses tells him, See to it that you don't act deceitfully. See to it that you don't act deceitfully. Because Pharaoh does that during the plague of flies, during the plague of hails, during the plague of locusts. And each time he makes a promise, but then he changes his mind after the plague is over. Listen, the enemy uses this trap of deception to kill your hopes of things ever getting better. The shifting goalposts wear you down and and they make you think, man, I'll never achieve the dream. You keep doing your part of the bargain, but things don't get better. Things just don't work out. And I don't know whether you've ever been in that place of being deceived. A person tells you enough of the truth to make a decision, but then they don't tell you the entire truth to predict the outcome. And some of us, you've been deceived maybe at work, you've been deceived maybe in your marriage, you've been deceived maybe at a family level, and it has just worn you down. And what that does is that it it derails you from still pursuing your God-given purpose. Now, the fourth trap that I see in this story, and this is the final trap, uh, at least uh, 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 as I read the story, uh, and these are traps that were meant to derail Moses from you know, uh, his journey of bringing lasting change uh, to the people is the trap that I call the trap of dubious compromise. Now, of course, I said dubious compromise because I was looking for a D word, but I couldn't get a synonym for compromise. So I was like, okay, maybe I said decompromise because you just came from Ghana. I was like, no, decompromise won't work. So I said dubious compromise the trap of dubious compromise. When Pharaoh realizes that he couldn't derail the Israelites forever and the magicians could no longer replicate the miracles, he started laying compromises for Moses and Israelites. And I believe the compromises was meant to give the Israelites some form of freedom, but still keeping them in slavery. Listen somebody to me. God wants total freedom for you. So don't settle for a compromise. Don't settle for a compromise because God is bringing nothing short of total freedom. What were these compromises that Pharaoh gave? Number one, it was a worship compromise uh, where he says worship but stay in the land. A placement compromise rather. He tells them in Exodus chapter 8 verse 25, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to the Lord your God. Here in the land. Ha! Like you do, okay, sour, Mavunait, you want to be radical, you want to do everything, you want to do the to achieve your God given purpose. Okay, do do the worship thing, but stay in the land. What does it mean? You see, Egypt is a metaphor in scripture of worldliness. And so he's saying, hey, don't leave the world, man. Like, you know, don't, don't let people see the difference between you and them. You know, don't be too radical as to be different. Like, you know, sleep in on Sunday. Like once in a while, at least go once in a while. Or, you know, don't, don't let there be a difference between you and the people around you. Let me ask you this, uh, 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 you who's watching today. If, if, <laughs> if the government says they are convicting all believers 
Would the people around you have enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> or you've been worshiping, but in the land. You go to the club when they go to the club. You, you know, you, 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 you know, you, uh, you, your moral boundaries are everywhere. That, you know, you are worshiping God, but you are in the land. You are in the land. There is no difference between you and them. That's a compromise that catches many believers. The next compromise that, Moses, that, that Pharaoh gives um, uh, Moses was, don't go very far. Exodus 8.28, Pharaoh said, I will let you go offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. In other words, this is, this is a compromise of convenience. You sort of have both worlds. You, you are in the wilderness to worship, but you're not very far. You can come back to Egypt if and when you want. You see, Christianity and, and, comp on, and convenience, you know, don't go, you know, they don't go hand in hand. You, you need to be able to be radical. You need to be able to go all in. Leave nothing that will call you back to Egypt. Go all out. Not, not just on the edge, but all out. The third compromise was leave your family out of it. I mean, it's you we want. Leave your family out of it. Exodus chapter 10 verse 8 to 11 says this. Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, he said. But tell me who's going. Moses answered, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, because we, have to, we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord our God. Pharaoh said, the Lord be with you if I let you go, along with your women and children. Clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord. Since that's what you've been asking for, then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. Now that compromise dealt with the family. Pharaoh releases the men, but he wants to keep the family in Egypt. And many times as people, especially those in the urban centers, we fall for that compromise. We fall for that trap, uh, 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 especially in our generation. And we go, you know, like, well, I really don't want to, you know, uh, impose my religion on my children. I want to let my children find their path. You know, I don't want to impose on them. And that's a bit dumb because we never do that about any other aspect of our children apart from religion. <laughs> you know, no parent ever says, you know what, I don't want to impose a school I like on my child. Let them, let them find their way around it. You know, I don't want to impose my vacation sport or, or, you, know, uh, uh, or you know, even our home. Which parent ever went to, to you know, gave a birth to a child in the hospital and then says, you know what, I don't want to impose my, my house in Nairobi on them. So, so no, let me let them find their path. <laughs> we don't do that. But many parents are happy to go worship God and leave their children in Egypt. But Moses is like, no, we are going with all our kids. Let me give you a story. So last week, Mavuna downtown in our, our church, we had a kids camp. And, and my son uh, is on school holiday and had quite a bit of backlog with his homework. And so he told the teachers, so the teachers at church say, hey, Sean, are you coming for camp? And, and the teachers, he, my son tells the teachers, um, you know, I, I, I can't come because I have quite a bit of homework and so I'm not coming for camp. So he shares that with uh, my amazing wife. And my wife tells this to my son. He says, Sean, don't you know that going to church in this house is non-negotiable? Hey! I was like, give me a hug. I love this woman. <laughs> Don't you know that going to church in this house is non-negotiable? And you know, my son went for camp and he still did the homework. <laughs> and I've realized that the more my wife and I love church, the more my son loves church as well. Maybe you're here today and, and you've really, you, you've left the family out of it. God calls you to a life of influence and, and he invites your family in as well. Mom and dad, listen to me. Uh, uh, you know, husband, listen to me. The call of God of your, over your life is not yours alone. God has a part of, for your family as well. So don't leave them out of it. You need to be able to pull them in. God, God's plan includes them as well. The final compromise was a compromise that dealt with finances. Exodus chapter 10, verse 24 and 26. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you as well. Only your flocks and herds, only leave your flocks and herds behind. 
The four compromises include, included their economic enterprise. And so Pharaoh was okay to let the people go as long as their economic engine remained in Egypt. But Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 says this, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well. Pharaoh knew if these guys left their economic engine, their herds and flocks behind, that's where their heart will be consistently. Where you deposit your treasure, there your interest and interests will be. If I made a deposit today and bought Kenya Airways, you know, um, uh, shares, best believe I will be looking at Kenya Airways every time. My interest and interests will remain there. And so maybe that's, that's someone today. For you, your salvation has been your salvation, but then it has been, you know, uh, divorced, so to speak, from your economic engine. And you, you know, some people say, this is for work. This is for, this is, I'm looking for bread. I'm still born again. This is, this is just for my, no, 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 no. Do not leave your hearts and flocks behind. Even those ones are included in God's redemptive purpose. Now, let me conclude, Mavuno Church. All these traps are meant to derail you from progressing in the work of influencing the, church, the, the, the change that you want to see. When you settle for any one of these traps, what happens is that your heart becomes lukewarm and you no longer have the passion for the things that you, had, uh, that you once had the passion for. And you begin to experience mission drift. And sadness begins to fill up your soul because uh, uh, lukewarmness for a believer, that's what lukewarmness does for a believer. You have too much of the world to enjoy the Lord, but also too much of the Lord to enjoy the world. And so you get stuck in lukewarmness. You are made for more. You are not made to fill and to get stuck. How do you get off the traps? Revelation chapter 2 verse 5 says, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. Number one, consider how far you have fallen. Evaluate the trap that you fell for. Is it the trap of discouragement? Something happened and you felt completely discouraged. Or maybe doubt came into your heart. Or maybe you went through a season of deceit that, you know, pulled you away. Or dubious compromises that you fell into. Which trap have you fallen? Think through that. Where did the passion fall at? Number two, the Bible says repent. Meaning that you turn away from those things. Once you realize, man, I got discouraged when, you know, the business didn't work out, when the marriage proposal didn't go through. When you, re when you realize that, then you repent. You turn away, you move away. And then the Bible says this, then do the things you did at first. Go back to the original call. Go back to doing the things that he wants you to do. Some of you need to go back to serving. Some of you need to call back the discipleship group together and say, guys, let's start missing, meeting physically even as we open up the new season. Some of you need to go back to prayer and fasting even as I've invited you to join us, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, on the last week of uh, August as we do, uh, as, you know, for, for a time of prayer and fasting. Some of you need to go back and do the things you did at first. And so, as I end this sermon today, I want to say this to you. You, yes, you, Will you say no to the enemy's traps? Have you been blessed by that message? I hope you have. A couple of things I want to invite you to do. Number one, just share this message with other people so that they can be as blessed as you are. Invite them even as you complete the sermon series uh, next week. But for today, I want to pray for you who is in that place of discouragement because uh, that can keep you from hearing God's voice over your life even in this season. Maybe some of you, you've already fallen into a trap and I want to pray that God's grace will be able to yank you out of that. Heavenly Father, thank you for that brother, that sister, that father, that mother who's watching this today and they recognize that they're in a place of discouragement. My Lord and King, I want to pray for just your, your grace upon them. I want to pray that you may be able to show them that you are still on track to delivering the promise. Some others have fallen into the traps of compromises, Almighty King. Maybe they have, you know, they have given up on their families or they have given up on their careers or separated those two. Lord, I want to pray that your grace and mercies will be upon each and every one of them so that our life of influence can be everything that you created it to be. I give you glory and I give you praises. In just name I do pray and believe and all of us said, Amen.